So today's topic for this webinar is 2035 emission goals for transport, realistic or just hype? And today I am delighted uh, to have a great panel of guests with us today. Um, that, so without further ado, what I want to do is just quickly give each of the panelists a 30 second quick intro of themselves um, and their roles and, their, and the reason why that they're here today. And then we're gonna get straight into some, some great questioning around these 2035 goals and where we head within the transport industry. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over firstly to Matt Weston MP, just to quickly introduce yourself, please, Matt. Hello, many thanks and welcome to everyone. It's great to be involved in this. So my background, I was in the industry uh, for 24 years. Uh, I was a, made an MP back in 2017. I'm now chair of both the all-party uh, motor group and also uh, for the all-party parliamentary group for electric vehicles. Very interested and very concerned about the current situation and uh, hoping that this will be uh, very informative for me as well. Thank you, Matt. And then I'm just going to bring Eman in from Bosch, who is on the line with us. Hi, Eman. Hi, Helen. Um, I don't know what happened, but you can see me me um i'll try to fix that later so emma martin i'm responsible for political affairs and government relation within bosch thank you emma and uh, next we, ha we have james stevens james hey, good afternoon everyone i'm uh, i'm james stevens i'm the director of government and corporate affairs at aston martin uh the gonda uh prior to my role at aston i held a similar role at nissan so i've gone from working for a large car company to working for small car companies so an interesting perspective to have for both ends of the spectrum. Thank you, James. And lastly, we've got Andy Eastlake from Low CVP. Hi, Andy. Hi, Helen. Thanks very much. Uh, Andy Eastlake, uh, I run the Low Carbon Vehicle Partnership, which is a uh, cross government industry grouping focused on accelerating the uptake of lower carbon vehicles and fuels. My background is uh, 25 years of automotive test and development, really focusing on uh, emissions, fuel efficiency, and uh, Good economy so a lot of a lot of engineering background and a, a policy focus now going forward thank you and, and thank you panelists you have passed the first test of being able to introduce yourself in under 30 seconds so thank you um so i want to just get straight into it then so look i think for most of our um guests here on on the webinar today and welcome thank you very much everyone for joining us you'll all be aware that the government has in the uk has committed to um, carbon neutrality by 2050 and I think everybody probably here on this session knows that and the current targets for transport in terms of neutrality are 2040 but recently the government has launched a consultation looking at what the possibility of a 2035 target or even earlier uh, might be in terms of possibility and in particular around the phase out of internal combustion engines and hybrids. So this is where we see ourselves today and really for this webinar what we want to do is really discuss firstly is that possible, is it simply just hype, it's sort of political hype or is this actually a reality that we can reach and if so how do we reach it? Do we have the plans um, to move forward today as they are? Or we are, is it that we need to start doing some different things in particular in light of what's going on currently? So without further ado, I guess my first question, and I'd like to ask this to you, Eman, is the industry really fully on board, do you think, with these 2035 targets? Eman, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me yeah, now? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, okay. okay so uh, we are fully supportive of the government initiative to achieve 2050 carbon neutral targets and uh, the ambitions to see uh, continuous decarbonization of uh, transport. We also take individual responsibility as, uh, as Bosch uh, undertaking necessary measures to achieve climate neutrality for uh, our more than 400 location worldwide by the end of 2020. Um, we believe as well that the carbonization or decarbonization should take a place in line with the reduction plan set out in the successive carbon budget, uh, especially um, the upcoming fourth carbon budget 2023 and 2027. So we are fully, fully supportive. Super, thanks, Eman. And James, would you would you also agree with that? I mean, are you as Aston Martin 
uh, on board with these 2035 targets in principle? Uh, I think I think the industry is obviously, as Emman was saying, uh, has is, is fully committed to to support the government's ambitions here. Um, I think we we need an element of reality check. We've been working until a 2040 target. Um, 2035, uh, whilst not unachievable, uh, represents significant challenges I'm sure we'll come on to. So I think we all recognise there is a need for, for decarbonisation across across industries and that transport is is often seen as a low-hanging fruit, uh, a slightly easier uh, target. So we're supportive of the government's ambitions here. We're just going to be real, realistic about the dates. I think one of my biggest fears is 2035 becomes a target and then next year we, we focus on 2032. Uh, and we can't keep changing that, that that quickly. But presumably there are some really big challenges. If we were to hit a 2035 target on this, there's some big challenges both in terms of, uh, I suppose, industry and, and maybe perhaps even wider society. Matt, from your perspective, wh where do you see the challenges in terms of trying to reach that 2035 target, do you think? I, Helen, I think they're huge challenges. Uh, they're massive for manufacturers. Of course, and uh, that should not be uh, understated. And particularly uh, given this current crisis, uh, the impact is going to be profound, as we know. The opportunity, uh, resilience to invest in the future technologies uh, will be, be impacted. Uh, but we also have to think about what role the government has in this. And picking up on James's point, really, and that is giving consistency and surety, really, uh, over the, uh, about the horizon, whether that's 2040, 2035, or as James was hinting, 2032. You know, these really impact on manufacturers' investments. And I think there has to be absolute certainty uh, and then support, really, uh, for that. Not just, you know, financial support, encouragement towards uh, gigafactories being built for, for battery technologies, uh, hydrogen uh, uh, sources as well. Uh, but then also what uh, impact that has on uh, consumers, uh, because consumer confidence is going to need to be uh, supported in the short term to ensure there is a transition, really, between uh, current ICE and future technologies. And I just want to bring in Andy on, on those points as well. I guess from, from a low CVP perspective, Andy, where, where do you see the challenges? Just, I guess, adding on from, from Matt's comments. Yeah, well, I think, I think we would see uh, this as an opportunity as, as well as a challenge. And uh, I think it's really important that we look at how complex this is. Uh, having a very blunt sort of 2035 uh, aim to end the sale really doesn't uh, articulate how many things are going on here. We're talking about changing people's mobility habits and obviously uh, with, the, uh, with the current crisis uh, actually moving people away from mass transit back into cars, that's changing the dynamics. We're talking about changing the ownership models of vehicles fundamentally, going away from the, the traditional owning a car for lots of years and, and now renting it and uh, sort of leasing it on a monthly basis or so there's so many things going on with that. And then there's the technology, the vehicle technology, as, as Matt articulated, batteries. And if we wanted to model the same number of vehicles being sold in 2035, as we typically sold last year, 2.5 million vehicles or 2.3 million vehicles, that's a huge task in terms of battery and manufacturing capacity. Uh, and that's not necessarily what we want to see if we're looking for a mobility system and an energy system that, that work towards net zero in the 20, 30, 2050 timeframe. So it's a far more complex problem than just a, a single line statement, I would say. Yeah, and, and I guess just picking up on the, the point around mm. the phase out of internal combustion engines and the phase out of potentially hybrids as well, um, that's gonna pose a big challenge for, for society and kind of consumer behavior. I just wonder if, um, Emma, and you'd like to just pick up on that point in terms of what does that mean for, for consumers? What does that mean for the industry in terms of that phase out of ICEs and, and hybrids potentially? Great question, Helen. Not that we have the same uh, color of our jumper, but as well as... <laughs> <laughs> same as last time. Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, so, uh, great question in the perspective of... Um, 
talking about the technology neutral approach and why this is really important before I answer the question, because you want to achieve a certain policy measures and um, you achieve that in considerations of the old and new technologies without any specific treatment for one technology or another. Why I'm saying that, because unfortunately, uh, with the, uh, having a consultation titled Ban ICE um, by 2035, it does reflect negatively in the market. Why is that? Because the people who are uh, buying cars this year or bought cars this year, um, they obviously will not be able to resell their cars in the next two years. And that means is they will hold off buying lower emission uh, vehicles. And if we look into the average age of cars, uh, usually in the UK, it's about eight years. We're talking about uh, potential um, uh, emission uh, ends by 2035. So you have 15 years approximately. So you will still have existing park fleet, these vehicles in probably 12, 15 years. Hence why that will be itself a challenge and means is uh, we need to think more about the decarbonization strategy in total and not actually in, you know, try to pick one technology or, or another. The ICE technology will be mostly measured, mostly electrified by 2035. Um, however, it's needed for the transition period. Um, if we look, for example, in compact cars with hybrid plug-in, uh, which is mostly ICE plus electrification, you could actually, with using the renewable uh, fuels, you could then have uh, a carbon reduction of 60 to 70 percent. However, one size doesn't fit all. Means is if we have we have in the call Aston Martin sport cars, for example, wouldn't be able to use the battery technology because they need high acceleration, they need rapid speed. Hence, why we just reflection on the Formula One, for example, they will bring the um, uh, hybrid uh, e-fuel uh, model by 2030 and then that goes on and on with the trucks because they need a high voltage battery or maybe hydrogen so one size doesn't fit all and we need a plan if we want to fix a date I just, that's, a, that's a great point Eman and I, I think just to expand on that James as, as Eman mentioned you I might I think I should bring you in on that point around the phase out of ICs. I mean, you guys have got big, powerful cars. Um, you know, what, what does that mean for you in terms of going forward and that phase out of ICs? Is there another way or should we just, you know, stop what we're doing and do a, a big immediate transition to electric? Is that the only way? I think to start with, we need to recognise that car companies haven't been static for the last 30 years. There are um, specifically in the last three years since WLTP uh, came in, we've, we've been making significant improvements as an industry uh, year on year as new cars come out. I mean, you cannot underscore the investment required to, to make these improvements in, uh, in, in, in technology. I mean, a, a, an internal combustion engine today compared to one 20 years ago is a completely different animal. So I, I think we need to look at the sort of the macro picture of how cars are developed. Um, I mean, looking, for, looking at Aston Martin's specific needs, um, you know, platform cycles are typically around 14 years uh, as an industry average. That's a platform, not a vehicle. Uh, you'll probably get two vehicles off that platform back to back. Um, and, and the company investing in that new platform will want to recoup that investment over that 14 year period. Um, so if we launched a, a new platform today in 2020, it would essentially be phased out in 2034. So I think the idea, idea of coming up with, with dates, and my earlier point, and, and Matt touched on this as well, of changing these dates, we need to plan a long way in, 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 in the future for what we're going to be doing. So uh, we launch our DVX, um, literally it's, it's on the production line, customer cars are being made right now. Um, and you know, that's 2020, so essentially that platform, that car's on, took five years to develop. Um, so walk back five years ago, that's when we were thinking about what this would look like. And we'd hope to get at least for about 14 years of life out of the platform. That gives you a sense of scale of, of how long car companies have to think about things in the future. So coming up with dates um, uh, for very, very good rational societal reasons, you need to think about what you know, the phraseology is being used. So that, that the term ban phasing out isn't helpful for the reasons that Emma said. Um, but I think, you know, I think the overarching point here is we need to look, we, we need to let 
innovators innovate. So car companies have innovated huge amounts over the past few years. I think there's an opportunity here to say, we've all got a problem. We all recognize the need to solve said problem. That's, that's reduction in emissions from, from transport. Let the clever people that work for car companies come up with clever solutions. I don't think there's any particular technology, as Emma was saying, that is right for all applications. There will be some technologies that are right for HGVs, some for buses, some for vans in a city, some for intra-city travel, some for sports cars. But we need to let the clever people in car companies come up with the solutions that fit within a sort of a framework matrix of what societal regulators can accept. Thanks, James. I mean, take your point about clever people in um, the industry in terms of finding the solutions. I'd like to bring in Matt, actually, just in terms of what role government should play in terms of this side of the debate. And in, in particular, I think, Matt, from your perspective, obviously you're heavily involved uh, with the All Party Group um, for Electric Vehicles. I'd be interested to know your view in terms of where the phase out of ICEs and hybrids sit in your perspective are you take a pragmatic approach or is it something that you you think needs to be ended and that we all need to shift to evs i think we've just lost matt's sound so i'm just going to ask him to unmute here we go can you hear me now we can hear you now matt thank you sorry about terrific that. sorry about that no problem uh, yeah, I was just saying that uh, I, I think we need to be ambitious um, and it's important that the sector is ambitious and it, it is naturally, you have to be to succeed. Uh, and, and, you know, the last 10 years, uh, the UK automotive industry has been phenomenal in its growth. Uh, and, and that has been born from a, a degree of government invent, intervention, which I think is really important but also uh, outward investment into the UK. Uh, and, and that has, uh, has seen great rewards uh, for UK-based uh, companies. Uh, I believe that the government needs to, as I said, have a, a clear framework. Um, and not trying to duck the, the question, we need to be ambitious. I think 2035 would be sensible but it absolutely needs government support to get from here in 2020 to 2035. It's not simply a case of saying, there's the target, go for it, or maybe we'll flex that target in future. So what I mean by that is we need to get consumers buying again now in the next few months. One of the things I was involved with uh, a week ago or so uh, was actually getting people, uh, getting showrooms reopened as of, uh, today. And that was a cross-party move uh, that I chair uh, in, in doing that. Now, what I want is us now to stimulate demand. The government needs to put money into uh, encouraging people towards cleaner vehicles. Now, that can be clean diesel today, uh, but in three years' time, five years' time, it will be maybe hybrid, or it may be hybrid now, depending upon what the consumer wants. But the government, I think, uh, is there to govern, to show leadership, to give the frameworks for consumers to encourage people to use the markets. Uh, now, alongside that, we have to have investment uh, into the infrastructure for EV. And we are way off the pace, I'm afraid, compared to other nations, particularly France and Germany, and obviously countries like Norway as well, which goes without saying. Um, and that's what I hope we will see, is um, those sorts of investments coming in. Some of it uh, government funded, actually. Uh, and then that lays the markers, I think, for, for industry to follow. So I see intervention as an, an important part uh, that government can play. Thank you, Matt. Um, Andy, just bringing you in then here, from, a, from an ICE and hybrid perspective, sort of ending those in 2035, where, where do you stand on that? Uh, well, I'll, I'll declare an interest as I drive a range extended car at the moment, which, uh, which does everything I need, almost all of it in electric mode. So. Um, I think we have to think about the end game, the end game 2050, net zero emissions transport. We know that uh, at the moment, uh, about 40% of our car fleet is older than 10 years, is older than 10 years. So, you know, 40% of your vehicles, if we had a 2040 aim to, to end, uh, you know, emissions, you know, that, that, wouldn't, that would leave us with a, a huge backlog. So we, I think 2035 is the right sort of, the right sort of timing. Um, I think we've got to focus on the objective and not the technology. And I think that's, that's the danger is, 
What are we trying to achieve? And that's net zero emissions. We actually have net zero fuels for combustion engines already. A, a, a renewable biomethane used in a heavy duty vehicle sourced from manure waste or whatever is actually pretty much uh, net zero from a greenhouse gas perspective already. And we have also acknowledged that in areas of transport, we are gonna have combustion fuels, renewable combustion fuels, particularly aviation, that's seen as, as, as uh, ultimately what we need. So I think picking up James's point, actually there's a lot more nuance in the horses for courses. Right now, an electric car, pure electric car, makes a lot of sense for quite a few people. If you look at the way that a lot of cars are used at the moment, uh, I think the average petrol vehicle is driven 7,000 miles a year uh, in its first three years. That's only 35 miles a day. Actually, an awful lot of that mobility can be electrified very, very quickly. So I would actually see us moving forward faster than 2035 in some areas. Uh, so in taxis, in city centre urban deliveries, you know, I think we can electrify and, and go zero emissions, if you like, far more quickly but then there are cases and uh, and this uh, you know we've not touched much on vans but if you think about a big heavy transit van driving up and down the motorway that is really really challenging to electrify in a time frame and that might need a different solution uh, and i think one of the challenges we face is looking at this in a very sectoral way at the edges of cars and vans you go into trucks and quadricycles and if you don't think about those, what you'll do is force people out of the car and van into something else that isn't being regulated in this way. Um, one last point, I think we have to remember we've never banned horses, um, but we transitioned from horses to ICE engines and cars very, very quickly indeed, because they were just better. And I think if we can make it better, that whole experience uh, in the way that actually it is for a lot of people already, uh, this transition will happen faster than people think uh, for a lot of the miles that are driven. Thanks, Andy. And, and thank you to the um, webinar audience for taking part in our, our quick poll. I just want to share these results with you. Um, so whilst you guys have been talking, we've just asked our audience whether they believe that we need a mix of technologies. So relevant to, I think, your points um, that actually all of you have made. Do we need a mix of technologies or is electric the only way? Well, actually, as you can see, there are around 85% of you on this um, session today believe that actually we need a mix. So it's just to your point just there, Andy, I think from a sectorial approach, but also a technology approach, one size does not fit all, I think, as, as Emma was saying earlier. So I want to just keep on that um, technology neutral element there and just kind of get an idea in terms of what that approach might be from a technology neutrality. But before I do, we talk about it a lot, but what does it actually mean? Eman, maybe you can shed some light on that. Technology neutrality, we talk about it, but what's your definition? Oh, and I think we've just got, let's give her some sound. Yeah, can you hear me now? We can hear you, go ahead very disciplined here. You, you muted all of us, so <laughs> um, technology neutral approach is uh, the meaning really not to uh, disintensivize uh, a technology or another uh, and, or pick one technology or another. It's just that you will act more neutrally on the basis of you are, what you are trying to uh, achieve. And the technology neutral approach in this perspective is, uh, we, can, we can explain it that way, the best means um, it, it, with a strong focus on electrification, of course, including hybrid, hybridization and fuel cells supplemented uh, by the use of renewable fuel to uh, power optimize ice. I mean, it's a very complex sentence, but what I'm trying to say is that you need, uh, obviously, to run the technology, you need also to look into the fuel. And again, what also Andy said, renewable fuel or e-fuel or advanced fuel, we're talking about cleaner fuel. And when we talk about the cleaner fuel, we will uh, uh, then talk about the discussion, which we will have probably later, is wheel to wheel. So the consideration now of just having tank to wheel is not satisfying our ambitions to achieve the targets by 2035 or by 2040. So it means is we need really to look into, in the whole value chain of then creating 
a better agenda for the climate change. And, and in that perspective is uh, why we're banking have, uh, if you like, an impact on the energy mix uh, and our behavior as well in the decarbonization strategy to consider renewables or nuclear to be a part of the mix to then actually achieve this carbon neutrality, not only due to the transport, but also for the environment around this transport moving forward. Thanks, Emma. So I guess what you're saying there is it's, it's about big picture stuff, isn't it? It's about actually looking at the solution as the goal um, rather than, you know, taking certain elements out and saying, you know, being too prescriptive on it. It's about allowing the technology. James, I just want to bring you in, if I may, just from your perspective um, in terms of technology neutrality and where you guys at Aston Martin stand. If you could just unmute yourself as well. I'm fighting the uh, the mute system. Sorry. Um, yeah, I, I, th I think from Aston Martin perspective, we've got to look at and and, and any, any car company would be the would be the same, uh, bar, barring our friends at Tesla. Um, it, we've got to look at the right solution for the product. So some of our vehicles in the future will, as as Andy was saying, will naturally fit a, a BEV route. Um, they'll be lower mileage. They'll probably be more luxurious in a in a city product. Um, I think at the moment the the sports car, the GT car, the core of who Aston Martin are, does not lend itself naturally to uh, uh, the battery electric technology of today. I sort of say it won't in the future. Uh, hydrogen, uh, you know, our former CEO uh, didn't particularly have a, a good feel for hydrogen, so I, I won't comment on that particularly. But hybridize, hybridization and the greater use of synthetic fuels, as Andy was saying, you know, we see great hope for this. So our first hybrid um, a a engine is, isn't in one of our products yet. It's still being developed. So we'd like to see hydri uh, hybrids, that is, uh, continue to be used for some time. And, you know, increasing the use of a synthetic fuel with that would further reduce its uh, CO2 content uh, down to, as Andy said, zero, perhaps. So uh, I think that's where we are as a company. I think the you can't rule the technology out. Um, in, in, until it's it's obsolete or it doesn't work. So Andy's point about horses, which is brilliant. Um, I think we'll look at everything uh, whilst it's realistic to look at it. Thanks, James. I I'll be interested just as a supplementary question back to you about synthetic fuels. Can you expand on that a bit? Because to be honest, you know, I've been involved in um, electric vehicles and low carbon vehicles, you know, for a good 10 years, but I'm not that aware in terms of what synthetic fuels can offer uh, in this debate and, and how they can form part of the, the sort of the roadmap towards 2035. Could you just expand on that point a little bit? I, I, I can with my, my limited knowledge, probably the best person to answer is, is Airman, seeing as Bosch are doing a lot of work around synthetic fuels. But fundamentally, you've got uh, you know, bioethanol, which is a synthetic fuel. It's manufactured. It's not a, it's not a petrochemical. Uh, you could e equally have biomethane, uh, which is another, another synthetically made fuel. Again, these are fairly uh, early on the TRL scale and technology readiness level, uh, so they're not ready to be at the full court just yet. But you see, whenever you pick up the pump, uh, you'll, you'll see E5, E10 coming soon. So there's an element of synthetic fuel within the gasoline and diesel today already. Um, I think we just need to be continue going back to Erman's point, not pick a technology, not write something off because it doesn't fit the in vogue uh, argument today, but actually invest, continue to look, continue to innovate to ensure that we've got the best opportunities to decarbonise uh, as soon as possible. Thanks, James. In fact, I would like to just bring Eman in, if I may, just to kind of add to that point around synthetic fuels. Eman, did James do a good enough description? I know you're an engineer by, by trade, so w was that good enough or is there something you want to add a little bit more onto? He did a good job. I mean, what I can just add to that is um, the synthetic fuel varies. So, for example, you could have synthetic fuel uh, mixed from, from gas uh, or fossil fuel, and then you could increase the chemical extraction, um, which is done through renewable energy. Uh, it could be in the mix of 20 to 30% to 40%. We as Bosch, for example, for the Bosch management vehicles, used CARE diesel, which is 100% comes from renewable, and it's a byproduct of a waste material uh, um, you know, you, you can use it. So you, you're not only talking about uh, renewables here, but you are talking about uh, circular economy 
um, which is make it actually in our perspective more attractive from the climate change gender perspective. Thanks, Aman. Just on the chat, I noticed Steve Sapsford has just mentioned around the difference between synthetic fuels and biofuels. Is there much difference between them? Uh, I didn't see his email, uh, his email, but yeah, there is. I mean, it, it depends on the extract you're using. Uh, that's why I mentioned the renewables of 20 to 30 percent to 40 percent. Um, you could also use it from the um, solar energy. So, for example, there are some trials in uh, the Sahara of uh, Morocco, for example, to look into um, using um, a, a kind of uh, solar battery storage in the perspective of um, um, uh, renewable fuel. The, the problem here is, generally speaking, and now we're diverting to the uh, gas industry, um, you have refineries um, which needs actually uh, to uh, be invested in it and needs to hold for another 30, 40 years. So the oil companies, they are active in all of this alternative fuel, but obviously there's a huge investment needs to go in to make this product cheap enough to make it attractive for the consumers and i think the problem is if the refineries is still from the investment perspective um not there yet so to invest in another area it, it is, is difficult and that's why i mentioned that the government should consider the energy sector in that perspective and incentivizing them of having and offering uh, better products uh, from fuel in the market Thanks, Aman. And whilst we were talking on synthetic fuels, we've just uh, asked our uh, webinar guests as well just to share some thoughts whether they think we need to be considering alternative low carbon fuels in order to reduce carbon quicker. And an overwhelming 93% of you believe that we should, only a small 7% of you think that we should not. And I'm pleased to say that actually everyone on this call is, is so well informed that they didn't need any more information on it and that they, they have a clear opinion. So I think that's interesting because we don't hear about it quite so much, um, but clearly that's an area that needs to be perhaps brought into um, the policy structure a bit more. So I just want to move forward a little bit now um, and just look at that. We talked earlier about, um, Matt made some good points in terms of you know, the, the policy and the, the government infrastructure needs to be there both in terms of moving the automotive industry and the wider transport industry uh, forward. What should that roadmap therefore look like? And Andy, I think you picked up on it a little bit earlier about ensuring that you have not just a mix, but different sectors also require different solutions. So I wonder if all of you, I guess, just asking, because it is an important question, what does that roadmap, in your opinion, look like? Andy, I'll start with you. Uh, well, I think uh, I think one of the first things, and just coming back to, to Steve's comment actually about fuels, one of the first things is to look at the complete picture um, uh, of your total energy consumption. So we can we can use electric energy, uh, um, and, and we can use that electricity directly into a battery. We can make hydrogen. We can synthesise fuels with it. They use different amounts of energy, but at the moment we don't assess it on an overall energy efficiency. And I think there's some Getting the right metrics for what we're trying to do, whether that's moving people or stuff, is, is, the, is, is probably one of the first things we need to do in terms of moving forward. So rather than having a, a, a sort of narrow focus on the vehicle without thinking about its task, let's think about the journeys, the, the, the transport system. Um, I think you know, one of the key things that's come out recently is the air quality and the air quality benefits from the lockdown. Uh, there aren't a huge number of benefits from lockdown, but that's one significant one. And over 80% of the people said they wanted to, they would do something to retain those air quality benefits. So I think zero emissions, zero tailpipe emissions in city centres and urban environments, that's an easy win, politically quite powerful and quite uh, potentially quite, quite uh, positive. Uh, so we should be looking at specific applications and removing tailpipe emissions where they are most affecting the, uh, the, the uh, sort of health of, uh, health of uh, our, our populace. So I think there's focused activity there in terms of the type of technology or the type of output that we use. And I think that technology neutrality is about focusing on the, the objectives, not the technology. We want low carbon, zero carbon uh, and low emission. Uh, and then also targeting specific areas, uh, drive cycles, applications, 
and really pushing the boundaries on those to find the sweet spots and those sweet spots growing and growing. Uh, I'll, I'll stop at that point, but I think it's, it's about trying to get into the nitty gritty and laying out some clear targets along the way over the next 15 years. Thanks, Andy. And I guess speaking of those laying out of targets, we're almost looking at a bit of a roadmap. I just would like to bring you back in, Matt, on this next point, but looking at the wider, bigger picture, like the industrial strategy, and in light of everything that's going on and, and the points the other panellists have made, do you think we need to now relook at that industrial strategy in some sort of way, looking at that bigger picture of how we enable the wide, widest element of the transport industry to move forward on these, on these targets? Yeah, I think the, um, the need really is, is simple. We have to, the government ambition must be to protect our industry and uh, to ensure the, the wealth creation, the, the global leadership that we have in so many sectors, the great brands that we have and so on, uh, can survive this. And so I think you know, not only does the consumer need transitioning from where we are today to a different future, clearly uh, the industry does as well. And I think there's, there's a, a huge job that can be done there, whether it be as simple as uh, having every new home uh, built with uh, a, an EV charge point, for example. I, personally, I think we should have been doing that 10 years ago. I, I did it myself, okay? I was so convinced that this was the kind of thing that we should be looking at. Um, and every new office or storage depot or supermarket or whatever, we should be looking at uh, the sorts of charge points being put in there as part of the planning system as well. Um, we have to think about uh, how we change our urban areas as i think andy was saying that you know the the public are telling us they want cleaner air now and we have to meet what the what the public wants that's that's what politicians are there to do is is enable facilitate things to happen bring about changes which are positive and and i think that the uk you think the uk can lead on this you think about all the clean energy that we have from offshore wind we should have onshore wind as well we would be uh we would be so much better our energy would be so much cheaper if we did and i think we can make a dramatic difference uh by those sorts of investments being encouraged and allowed uh through uh, changed changes to government legislation uh to bring about the the the, the infrastructure the framework that i was describing earlier that will take consumers with us and as i said there needs to be some financial stimulus package also uh, to encourage people to go to um, cleaner diesel the different fuels that we've been talking about or whether it be to hybrid products or or straight to uh, ev or in the case of of commercial vehicles which we haven't talked much about but with commercial vehicles how the need is there for hydrogen uh, power as well so that's what I would like to see. Thanks, Matt. And just bringing in Eman actually from a industry perspective, I guess, and ensuring that the right policy measures are in place almost to have a clear defined roadmap to move forward. Do you see the industrial strategy playing a role? Is it something that needs to change or is it, is it fine for what it is, but we just need to create something else? What's your view? Um, so we, committed uh, 1991 when the whole discussions about decarbonization started to reduce uh, emission to 40% by 2030 and we committed as well uh, to reduce it 80% uh, by 2050. As we said before, uh, we were talking about the, the greenhouse gases or the net zero carbon. So the roadmap is already set from the industry um, in the perspective how we can achieve these targets. As, 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 uh, you know, as uh, James said, uh, we are a long-term uh, uh, industry planner, if you like. So we cannot act in short-term measures. So we have to plan in advance due to the amount of investment need to go in as an as a industry in general. So means is what I'm trying to say is we are committed anyway. And although there will be a temporary pause uh, investment in new technologies currently due to the COVID situation, however, we are still committed for the long-term climate 
change measure. And actually, we do see the whole decarbonization uh, is as uh, an operative, efficient measure for us um, to, first of all, to secure our business in the long term. And secondly, also, not only to look in uh, protecting the current job, so we have zero job losses, but actually to create additional jobs through all of these new technologies emerging from the, uh, uh, the, the emission targets where Matt actually was elaborating about. So the industrial strategy is really important, but I think we need to look into it again. And that's why uh, I meant with, we cannot just have a date without a plan. We need a plan with a date. And that means is how could we look into the emerging technologies? So for example, digitalization, uh, would be a part of this. We, we didn't speak about it yet, but to digitalize certain part of the industry and also the energy sectors will bring at least 40% more jobs to the current existing job what we have now. And that is something that has to be taken in consideration uh, moving forward, how we can create wealth plus having a green agenda. Thanks, Emma. And I think to your point about that job creation, I think Matt's also mentioned it earlier, you know, we're going to need that now more than ever uh, moving forward. And I guess we can't really have this webinar without talking about the current situation here and now today and the impact that COVID-19 has had and may likely to have on this sector and on this challenge moving forward. So I'm keen to hear actually from all of the panelists, just a quick perspective from you in terms of how you see that this um, recent crisis has both impacted and how it is likely to impact um, this particular sector and that move forward to low carbon? Do you think it's a benefit? Do you think that it will have a, a, ultimately a positive outcome for this part of the sector or do you think it's going to hold things back? So I'd like to just bring James in perhaps if I may first, who hasn't spoken for a while. Uh, thank you, Helen. Um, I, I think you know COVID nineteen has. Well, I don't think at all. It's it's, it's, it's glaringly obvious that COVID nineteen has had a huge impact on um, the industry as a whole, uh, or society as a whole. But in terms of the automotive industry, I think we should be again looking at the macro picture. We're at a paradigm shift in terms of powertrain, as we've been talking about. We're also at a paradigm shift in terms of uh, the connectivity and the user interface between a car. Uh, these 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 technology uh, investments are expensive uh, in a year where revenue is down substantially. So I think you know, whilst uh, you know, not speaking on behalf of Aston Martin specifically, you know, we're looking as as, car, as as the industry how to continue our investment plans. But I think inevitably there's going to be having some delay because you know, you can't invest what you don't have. And I think revenue for the first quarter of this year, as you've seen from the SMMT numbers in terms of number of cars manufactured was down 97 percent um well there just, just aren't sales happening so actually the, the ability of the car companies uh oem supply chain companies to invest is, is going to be limited this, this year so i think we're going to have some impact thanks james matt you've been very vocal in in terms of that need that the industry will require support and should um have support as we move out of this um phase what's your view in terms of that covid impact in terms of um, the decarbonisation for the longer term? Well, uh, the impact of, of COVID-19 is, is profound, isn't it, in, in so many facets. And as, as James was just saying, the stats, whether it be our production, uh, which was decimated, um, it was down 99% in, in April. Um, it's really very serious for all of us around uh, the industry. Uh, the last conversation panel I was involved with, you know, the key issue there was confidence that we talked about. And, and confidence across the board, whatever field we're in, we have to start consuming again. Uh, and that's, you know, I, I don't mean to lay the, 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 the problem at the government, the, the door of the government, but of course the government does have uh, the certain tools at its disposal. And we have to get people consuming again. They, people will consume if they've got money in their pocket and their money in the pocket comes from the work they're doing. So every sector has to start moving again uh, reasonably quickly. Um, I guess my, my concern about the, the impact of COVID is just, uh, particularly with big ticket items, is just how people are gonna feel about the confidence of retaining their jobs and so on. Um, 
and therefore their willingness to, to spend money. But I do think, um, I can't remember if it was uh, um, Andy said it, but I think it was, who was talking about, you know, people change, you know, events come along and people change their, their thinking. And, uh, and I think it is an opportunity for sure, this. Uh, and we have to look at it like, we have to look at it positively and think, well, what is the consumer going to want in five, 10 years from now? Uh, because there's been this seismic disruption, really, to the market, and we have to adapt accordingly. And I think it'll be those who, who are able to be agile in terms of the delivery. Uh, Andy was talking about ownership models and so on. Um, and, and I think there's some really interesting stuff that the sector can be doing about taking the consumer with you over the next 10, 15 years uh, so that we keep uh, revenues coming in, as James was saying, need those revenues if you're going to invest. Uh, so I, I, I see it as, as I said at the outset, I'm, I'm an, op, an optimist, uh, uh, very positive and see how I, how I see things, but they're certainly challenging. I just hope that um, the government working with industry can encourage consumers to start spending money so we can actually make these changes and bring about the transition we talk about. Thanks, Matt. Uh, quickly, Andy, I just want to bring you in just on a couple of points because I want to then start handing over to um, the audience to ask some questions. But just your view in terms of COVID and how that's impacting consumer demand and how long you think that's likely to, to go on for from, from your view. I think uh, one of the original models I looked at saw a, <clears throat> a V-shaped recovery, which I think was a bit ambitious. I think it's going to take longer than perhaps some of the models are suggesting. Um, I think it's quite interesting and, and uh, you know, we've seen the car market, just looking at the numbers, it's down 45%, 44% 44% year to date overall car sale, but actually battery electrics and plug-in vehicles are up significantly year on year. So they are bucking the trend of this, this sort of, you know, um, slowdown in the automotive industry. So I, I think like, a bit like Matt, I see this as a, an imperative. We've got to grasp this opportunity and try to, as people do make big ticket uh, purchases, as that, that comes back, let's make sure they're making really low carbon choices. Uh, having new car sales 100% um, electric, if those sales are only 2,000 a year, really isn't going to change our fleet and decarbonize us very quickly. So we have to be churning that fleet to a low carbon fleet uh, rapidly. I think what this also says is, well, there's a big industry that we sort of forget about in the, the manufacture of the fuels. And the UK has some really advanced thinking about combustion fuels. So what we need to do is perhaps divert some attention onto decarbonizing those combustion fuels, whilst this electrification agenda is likely to take longer than perhaps we perceived uh, a little while ago. So. There may be a bit of uh, tweaking, nuancing of where we invest, but you know we know that the focus on motors, powertrains, batteries, those are going to be absolutely critical going forward. Um, and we've seen, you know, we've got a really healthy bus industry, for example, which is obviously going through uh, some real challenges right now with public transport uh, uh, being, being sort of, um, uh, you know, removed from the uh, from the, the the mix at the moment. So there's a lot of things going on, and I think we have to grab that and say, yep, it's a, it's a reset for a low-carbon future. Yeah, thank you, Andy. And interestingly enough, we've asked also the, the webinar audience um, whether they think, will, will it slow it down or will it accelerate um, the, the, the low-carbon transport future? And actually, it's a bit of a mixed picture, but around 42% of you are telling us that you think it's going to slow down. 37% um, of you think it will accelerate and 21% of you think it's about the same. So quite a mixed picture, which I think we can probably take from that. It's very hard to predict um, how it is going to turn out. So thank you very much for that. I just, Helen? Yes. Sorry, sorry. Just, can I just add something to Andy's and Ma, um, Matt's point? I think that it's very interesting as, as we come out of COVID-19, you look at the different countries around, certainly around Europe and how they're stimulating their market. I think, I know the French... Uh, position has been to provide a, a a basic level of support with far far greater uh, uh, value comp uh, composition to to a an EV or an ultra low emission vehicle, and even the German model has been to provide I think it's four thousand euros as a basic 
uh, subsidy for a new car, a grant for a new car um, that would be applicable to every, any new product, but then adding that up to potentially 9,000 euros for the cleanest, uh, newest technology. So I think we can do both. I think Matt's point, we have to get the entire market moving now. Um, you know, people have got to have that, that sense to be able to spend, but you can do as Andy was suggesting as well by giving the, the, the cleanest technology that little bit of an extra kick by greater incentivization. Great. Helen, could I just come in on that? I, I, just that. to say that, I mean, as the French governor put in 8 billion to their automotive industry specifically, as you'll have picked up, I'm sure. The Germans are about to announce, I think, 5 billion uh, specifically. And that, these are big numbers, but that's what we've got to start talking about. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, so what I want to do now is just hand over to our audience. Um, audience, if you've got access to the chat box, please do type your questions in there to the panelists and we will do our very best um, to answer your questions. I've also had some questions sent in. Um, I'm gonna start with uh, Gary Wilson's question. Bear with me, because it's a long question, but what he's saying is, diesels provide the best CO2 in, a, in the IC environment. Companies like Bosch can develop highly efficient diesel control systems. When these are coupled with CO2 neutral fuels and hybridized, surely this gives us the best compromise of low CO2 and reduced particulates. So he adds um, geofencing so that vehicles can only run on electricity in ultra low emission zone areas um, and, uh, and highly altered ICE performance and LEZs and then run in normal mode for extra urban transport i think that means so i think what i think what gary is saying there is that you know you can have different solutions for different places based on the the areas that um have have um low emission zone areas as well plus to his point about the the diesel eman as he mentioned bosch would you like to just try and see if you can answer gary's question well i i just wanted to point out i didn't pay gary to ask the question <laughs> the great question gary thank you uh, well, it's actually, it's not a question, it's a comment. Um, he's absolutely right. We um, already reached with um, only changing the application for uh, diesel cars um, in, in our uh, engine development perspective. And we managed with also the combination with uh, e-fuel uh, to get into more than 80% reduction of NOx. And actually the newer diesel car, and generally speaking, they don't, emit NOx anymore. And if anyone wants to challenge me, I'm happy to share with them the, uh, the results. The, the problem is what we have now is not really about diesel or petrol, etc. I think the image of the technology is so trans and damaged that actually the people are, they, they don't want to buy diesel anymore because they're worried about the value of the vehicles in general. It's not only diesel, it's, it's, it's ice in general is at the moment in question marks of the, of the if you like, the sales value afterwards. Um, and as well as the, the people are not confident enough to buy EVs because they're worried about the range and about the battery, etc. So at the moment, the question is not which technology. At the moment, how could we get the confidence of consumers to buy lower emission vehicles in general. And I think that is something that needs to be discussed and uh, needs to be uh, in, in somehow uh, um, in, in, you know, commented in our strategy with the industry and government. Thanks, Emma. And Gary, I hope that um, answers your question. Um, next question comes from Nick Reed. He says, by delaying a shift to EV, how do we avoid Im embedding ICE use in the longer term? Wouldn't it be better to accept short-term paying for long-term gain through world-leading innovations in charging, active travel, telecommuting, e-cargo bikes, transport planning, etc., and manage a transition away from ICEs? Andy, I wonder if you could pick up on that point um, for Nick, because I know you have quite a broad range perspective in terms of um, the industry. Yeah, I think it's an interesting point, and and I, I agree with Nick that we've got to be transitioning to uh, electric vehicles or zero emission vehicles uh, as rapidly as we can to get us towards that 2050 target. Um, just stepping back, an electric vehicle is really bad if you don't use it because it's got a much bigger embedded carbon footprint than the battery and things, whereas a conventional vehicle. Uh, is really good if you don't use it. So there is a question about 
if vehicles are doing very low mileage, when you look at a life cycle basis, actually, uh, potentially an ICE will give you a lower overall life cycle than, a, uh, than an electric vehicle. The real thing we need to do is to put batteries into vehicles and sweat them. Sweat those batteries really, really hard because they are zero tailpipe emissions every mile you drive. So I think Nick's right. We've got to look very carefully at the way we get around, and that will be different from 40 million cars. I'm not saying we want 40 million cars on the road sweated all the time and driven around. It's about how do we want to get from A to B and how do we make that journey as low carbon as possible? But we have to think about life cycle. And this is where, coming back to Gary's point, actually having a smaller battery, having a battery that's the right size for the job and only using an engine if you've got to do the long distance, rather than carrying around a huge battery for the odd occasion where you drive to Glasgow. Um, I think there's some real sense that we need to get into the system to have the right tool for the job and the right size, particularly the right size battery for the tasks that we're undertaking. And things like e-cargo bikes have a, have a clear role to play, mobility as a service, um, how we use autonomous vehicles. All of these things mean that the 2030, 2040 timeframe is just completely different from what we're used to at the moment. Thanks, Andy. Nick, I hope that answers your question. Um, next question is from Benson Dubay. Um, Benson asks, was the 2035 target reached through a consultative process? And how was that date reached? Well, actually, Benson, the consultation is currently still out, um, I believe, on the 2035 date with the government at the moment. But I guess I'll, I'll just perhaps bring Matt in for a quick comment, who I know whilst you don't represent the government, Matt, you may well have a view in terms of the motivation behind that. No, uh, you're absolutely right. I don't represent the government. Um, <laughs> I, I represent the opposition, but, but I do work with the government, of course, behind the scenes on all sorts of stuff. Uh, so yes, as you say, Helen, it's, uh, it's actually out to consultation right now. Uh, I would encourage everyone involved uh, on this call to, uh, to submit to that consultation. It closes on the July the 31st. Uh, that's the only way that a good uh, decision uh, will be reached. Um, I, how they reached 2035, I'm not entirely sure. I think there was a bit of pressure. Um, saw what was happening in other countries uh, and perhaps that other countries were being slightly more ambitious than the UK and felt obliged, whatever, that maybe uh, needed to follow suit. So um, I'm, not, I'm not dismissing that. I'm, I'm just saying that's how I think it came about. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much, Matt. Um, I just want to go to um, Carl Heitz Lamprecht, who is asking a question. And I'm going to just summarise this, Carl Heitz, because it's quite a complex question. But what I think you're asking is, essentially, do we in the UK have enough energy now and in the future to be able to power a future that requires a lot more energy to propel our transport system? I hope that kind of summarises your question, Carl Heitz. But um, again, Andy, I guess from your perspective, because you deal with such a wide range of this industry, do you have a view from it, from the energy sector? I guess you deal with them quite a lot. Well, I think I think that's the interesting thing that's going on now is that we are connecting the transport and energy sectors together, literally, physically, with a with a piece of wire and a plug, uh, and that means that there are all sorts of uh, challenges and opportunities between those two. So particularly from an electric vehicle perspective, uh, if you've got a battery in an electric vehicle, suddenly that can be used in a really creative way to help the energy system that is now facing challenges of intermittency with renewables and things like that. So there's a lot of work we're doing in that space. The, the Electric Vehicle Energy Task Force is focused on trying to deliver an energy system that is uh, able to support the mass uptake of electric vehicles. I think this also comes back to this principle of we've got to look at energy efficiency in its pure form a little bit more accurately. If we start talking about what hours per kilometre, um, actually cycling is probably one of the best, you know, the lowest energy use transport systems um, on a what hours per kilometre basis, uh, substantially better than walking. Those, of course, are both powered with renewable fuels, our food, and it's a food fuel, and, and even an electric vehicle, an electric bus 
is actually down at the same sort of energy efficiency, fully laden electric uh, uh, buses around about the same sort of efficiency. So that's where using things like hydrogen, e-fuels in particular, these synthetic fuels can consume a huge amount of energy and we need to get that metric into our thinking so that we are looking at the overall energy efficiency. Ultimately, most of our energy is going to come back to uh, renewable electricity. That's the, the primary source. Hopefully, we will stop digging things out of the ground as quickly as possible. Uh, and therefore, we need to treat that precious resource with the respect that I think it deserves and try and use it only in the, uh, the places that we need it for the transport we need. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. We've, we've got quite a few more questions. I'm going to try and get through as many of them as we can. I'm conscious we've hit time. If you're, uh, those of you who are still on the webinar with us, thank you. We've still got quite a lot of you on here, so thanks for sticking with us. If you're happy to, we'll just continue on and try and do our best to answer um, your questions. So I'm going to just head over to a question from Steve Satsford. Um, Steve, you asked that no vehicles are zero emissions. It's just the carbon emissions that are not measured as they are away from the tailpipe. How can we move to a life cycle assessment of the technology so that an informed choice can be made based on application? I think that's an excellent point. And we did touch on well to wheel slightly in the discussion, but it would be quite good to, I think, expand on that point from Steve. Eman, can I bring you in on that one, please, just from, uh, from, from Steve's question? Yes. Um, I, I, you know, I, I will try my best, but I think also Andy would be very great yeah. for this as well so th that's why steve why we are banging on will to wheel because you're absolutely spot on in that perspective when you for example want to measure uh tank to wheel um let's say for example on, a, on an ice perspective a diesel or or gasoline so and i'm sure you know that diesel for example is the best for uh um, having less carbon and that's why the government incentivized diesel five years ago to bring the carbon down and then we had the NOx problem and now we solve the NOx at, uh, at the diesel car and uh, you know we have particulate matters in the in the ice and this is all can be measured through the uh, tank to to uh, to wheel however when we start to talk about automated driving cars about EVs and all of these um, uh, other uh, active transport activities as well um, then you need to talk about wheel to wheel because the decarbonization itself cannot be solved from just actually looking on the ta uh, tank to, to wheel. And it would be really interesting to then, and, and open it up maybe to your comments as an audience here, how could we bring this to public in a very informative, easy way to understand? Because my worry is the more we talk about emissions, tank to wheel and wheel to wheel, it's, it is probably confusing the consumers. This is really a job probably for low CVP to come with a concept. How can that be communicated in a, in a better way to the consumers? Thanks, Eman. Andy, do you want to just comment on that? I think she, Eman has just volunteered you for a, a new piece of work there. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an area we're really interested in. And, and Steve, thank you for the, for, the, uh, for the question. I would say that uh, well to wheel is absolutely essential right now. Uh, as Steve says, an electric vehicle, maybe zero tailpipe emissions, but our electricity system means that there are still emissions uh, from the, uh, the, 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 the electricity generation, of course, as indeed there are from brakes and tyres um, and, and, and those are for all vehicles. We have to move to a, to a life cycle assessment because it's embedded carbon uh, in batteries, in carbon fibre, you know, lightweight materials can be more energy intensive to produce, so we need to uh, that's not to say they're a bad thing, it's just we need to go in with our eyes open. I think one key point I'd like to make is that the net zero target is net zero in UK use, and it doesn't include our consumption emissions at the moment. And unless we take, and, and the CCC, for their, you know, to their credit, clearly acknowledge that, that we need to consider our imported carbon emissions, and if we're buying batteries from China, for all of our vehicles, uh, all we're doing is pushing a significant piece of that uh, that out offshore, and I think that's where you know we we're doing quite a lot of work in this space with life cycle analysis. Uh, Steve's involved in that, and uh, but uh, Emma makes an absolutely critical point. This is all really great and geeky engineering for us spreadsheet uh, uh, jockeys. For the general driver in the street, uh, we've got to come up with a much simpler way 
of helping them make the right choice for them at the right time that takes us on the pathway. And, and that is not easy. So uh, communications, 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 I think, when it comes down to it. Thanks, Andy. I'm just going to do a final question, which is from Ian Flynn. Ian says that the panel gave some examples of support for the auto sector, both in France and Germany, around incentivizing purchase. What other specific incentives and how, how delivered does the panel recommend the UK consumer or industry, if any? So I think you're saying there, Ian, is what other types of incentivization could there be for the industry perhaps currently? And also, how do you incentivize the consumer to act in the way that needs to happen in order for us to reach those goals? So I think, I think that's essentially your, your question there. Um, perhaps I can bring in um, James here on this question as you, you deal a lot with on the consumer side. Um, and then perhaps Matt for a quick comment at the end. A sure thing, uh, Helen, and uh, thanks for the question, Ian. Uh, I think you know we, we in the UK have the plug-in car grant, obviously, and the plug-in van grant that incentivizes uh, consumers to purchase uh, new uh, zero-emission um, vehicles. Uh, not particularly uh, large in terms of the overall fund, but it's been there managed by Olive for some time. Um, what, what the French and Germans have done is they've, they've, they've got similar mechanisms, but what they've decided to do is combine them uh, and, and increase the overall size to get the industry going. Sometimes I think it, you know having specific pots of money specific grants to apply for adds unnecessary red tape uh, and, and, and sometimes and i'm not an economist here but uh so beware the caveat uh, uh a, a a simple vat reduction so if you've got the plug-in car grant uh you know and you could see a say say a five percent reduction in vat for the cleanest potential uh, vehicles uh, or a three percent uh, reduction in vat for uh, for, you know, for everything else, then people are fairly clued up to what VAT is. You don't have to advertise another scheme. You don't have to have any uh, people managing it. Uh, Plug-in car grant obviously has a team of people looking after it, um, and, and the Treasury have to approve the budgets. So in my humble opinion, it's far better to collect 15% of something than 20% of nothing. Um, so I think a reduction in VAT would be the most logical way forward and a simple thing to do quickly. Yeah. Thanks, James. And just lastly, from you, Matt, just I guess a final word in terms of how to perhaps incentivise um, the industry and support it, and particularly in light of um, this move to low carbon come 2035. Well, I think the, the important thing is that uh, we need to stimulate demand full stop. Um, and you know, when one of the issues I think we've had in the last year or two has really been as a result of the, the diesel scandal, the emission scandal, that uh, a lot of people have held off purchasing any vehicle uh, because they've been uncertain about which technology to, to go to. And of course, it's stalled diesel sales. I think there'll be a lot of people out there who's still unsure about switching to EV. Uh, there'll be some people who will embrace it for the reasons that Andy and others have been mentioning. Uh, so I think uh, a, a, an across the board uh, sum of money uh, it, it, it may be flexed according to different technology and so on. But I think the thing is, some people will actually want to stay with diesel. Some people will actually be thinking, actually, I'm going to go back to petrol. Uh, and some people say, actually, no, I'm going to go to hybrid or whatever it may be. There are th horses for courses, as uh, you know, has been said earlier. I think we just need to get people out there buying. I think it'll be the next product, which will be the, the concern, really. That will be the transition product. Thank you, Matt. So we've, we've gone 10 minutes over time, but um, I wanted to stick with those that are still with us and ensure that we answer as many of the questions as possible. I'm sorry to those who we didn't get quite a chance to answer all those questions, but hopefully we were able to cover as many um, that kind of satisfied your needs for this debate today. Um, I just want to close by saying a massive thank you to the panellists. And I guess to summarise where we're at based on the discussion we've had today. I think it's clear, you, you've told us on the panel that, um, and, and the audience have told us that, you know, essentially we need a mix of technology. You know, it's not a one size fits all in order to get to that 2035 date. Um, and that might also include things like synthetic fuels. So we need to think of a much broader picture than simply just uh, a pure goal towards EV. Um, many of you think that COVID is probably going to slow things down and it probably will for the, for the initial period. 
but some of you also think that actually in the long run it may well have a beneficial impact in terms of how people behave and that point about people behavior has also been a clear thing that's come out of this discussion today and that really we also have to move consumer behavior into the right direction if we're to reach these goals as well it's not simply just about technology a good point that that Andy made. So um, there's still lots, I think, to consider there. And, and just a plug to say that the DFT's um, consultation is still open. If you do have comments, please do um, share them and put your views across within the consultation as well. Um, you know, lots of great points on here, and clearly there's a, a very well informed um, audience. So thanks very much for your comments. Thank you for your time and um, joining us today. Do look out for more sessions from the Leaders Live. Um, webinar sessions and we hope to see you again very soon. Thanks everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.